Thank you very much, Brittany, for that intro. And, and yes, I actually, I highly encourage all of you guys to register for that uh, wins some study time one-on-one -on -one with an instructor um, because I know I would love to spend time with you guys. I know the rest of the instructors would too, you know, should you choose them. So that's a great opportunity for you. So thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, in the next hour, hour and a half or so, I'm gonna try to clear away some of the cobwebs and some of the confusion surrounding what exactly IP addresses are, why we need them, what they look like, and um, what this thing called subnetting is all about. So we're gonna get as far into that as we can in the next hour and a half or so. I'm coming from the viewpoint that I'm assuming you know nothing or next to nothing about IP addresses. We're gonna to start totally from the ground level on up. So with that being the case, uh, everything's gonna be pretty much whiteboarded right here. So, you know, if you have a device that's getting on a network, whether it be a smartphone, a tablet, or your laptop, the whole reason you got on that net network is because you want to exchange information with something. You know most likely a website or a web server, although it could be some sort of instant messaging server, uh, YouTube videos, you know, whatever it is, you want to exchange data. Well, if networks were, were for example, point to point, where there were only two devices on the network, me, you, and that's it, nobody else, we wouldn't even need to identify ourselves. You know, whenever I wanted to send information to you, I could just dump it on the wire, and there's only one place it could go you because you're the only person on there and same thing if you want to send something to me i wouldn't need an address you just put on the wire here i am but the moment you have three or more devices on a network now all those devices they need names right they need identifiers so that when i put something in the wire i can explicitly say this data is for bob or this data is for sally or you know in technical terms this data is for google.com or this data is for ine.com so when we take our data, we need to append to it information about where it came from and where it's going to. And this is the whole purpose of the internet protocol. The internet protocol is to give us, among other things, addresses so we can get our data to their correct destination and they in turn can reply to us. Now, in the world of networking, you know, if you've done any studying, you probably know that there is sort of at a real high level, two different kinds of addresses, right? At, at, at uh, what we call layer two or the data link layer of networking, there is an, an address, which is just a number. And it just is, a, it's, it's like my name. It's like Keith or Keith Bogart, right? So if I say that my name is Keith Bogart, you know who I am, but you have absolutely no idea of where I am, right? So if, if you're in a, imagine this for a moment, if you're in a, in a room and the lights are all out, it's pitch black, dark, and then you just hear the name Keith Bogart. Well, you don't know if Keith Bogart is actually right there in the room with you, or if Keith, if that came from like an open door or an open window somewhere, and Keith Bogart's like the next room over, or the room over from that. You have no idea where that thing, person in this case, happens to be. So layer two addresses are like that. So if you're familiar with Ethernet and MAC addresses, that's what a MAC address is like. Every device you have that plugs into a network, whether it plugs in with a wire or via Wi-Fi, has a MAC address. And that MAC address is a unique identifier, but gives no clue as to what network or where that device is geographically. Now, if everything we were gonna talk to was on the exact same network as us, meaning it was on the same Wi-Fi network as us or on the same wired cable as us, we wouldn't need IP. We could just use layer two MAC addresses because everybody I want to talk to would be right there. But of course that's not the case, right? So the developers of networks decide, hey, you know, it's, it's not really scalable for a device to have to know the address and location of everything that could possibly be out there. That doesn't make sense. So addresses at layer three of the OSI model, the networking layer, so we're gonna talk about IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, those addresses give not only uh, information about you, you know, your unique identifier, your name, for example, so that might be the part of the address. So this is right here, this is your identifier, right? This is you. I'm not sure why my pen is working a little crazy there, but they also give geographic information. Pen's not working all that great this morning. Anyway, you get the idea. 
So an IPv4 or an IPv6 address gives both information about where you are and who you are, okay? So let's think about, for example, in terms of the post office, all right? So, you know, when I create a letter, I have to address that letter, right? I have to say this letter is going to my brother, for example, I put my brother's name on there. Well, if I just put that letter in the mailbox with just my brother's name on it, it wouldn't go any further than that because the post office would say, hey, we don't know where your brother is. You know, we don't know the name of every single human being on the planet and where they are. You have to give us some geographic information about how to get that to them. Same thing is true with IP addresses. Okay, so now that we know that, um, let's, for example, break down uh, what an IP address looks like. So for the longest time, for decades, IP addresses have followed the rules defined in the Internet Protocol version 4. So IP stands for the Internet Protocol, so IP version 4. And most stuff you put on a network these days is still in IPv4. But, oh, probably 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, a new form of IP came out, which was called IP version 6. You might say, hey, whatever happened to IP version 5? There actually is an IP version 5, but it has nothing to do with sending data on a network, how you address that data. It's something completely different. So when it comes to addresses and all that kind of stuff, they jump from 4 to 6. Okay, so the developers of IP version 4, which is way back in like the early 1980s, they said, hey, when somebody puts data on a wire and they call that data a packet, all right, so here is your data. Okay, maybe this is a, a request for a website. Maybe this is an instant message that you're sending upstream, okay? And then in front of that data is all kinds of information we need to put to get it on the network and so the network knows what to do with it. Well, in all that stuff, IP will take a portion of that and IP will say, We'll just say, then this is for both IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4, V6 will say, all right, I need to add my own information here, including where the packet came from, where the data came from, and where the data is going to, source and destination. All right, so what does that actually look like? Let's get rid of some of this. Okay, so in the world of IP version 4, they decided, the developers of this, that an address would be 32 bits long. Now, you might be saying, hold, hold, hold on a second. What's a bit? What are you talking about there? Well, a bit is basically um, just a single digit that's a zero or a one. So computers, they don't count in decimal like we do, you know, zero through 10. Computers count in bits, uh, in binary, zeros and ones. So they said, this is going to be 32 bits. Now, I'm not going to draw out 32 bits here, but we as human beings, we don't deal with binary. We don't deal with bits. So if you were to ask me, Keith, on your laptop, what's your IPv4 address? If I was to say, oh, it's 10110, you'd look at me like, who are you talking to? I'm not going to know what that is. So we convert, as human beings, to make it manageable, we convert the binary number that computers deal with into a decimal number that we as human beings are, are familiar with. So IPv4 addresses, you'll typically see them represented in what's called dotted decimal, which means you've got four decimal numbers. These are placeholders here, and they're separated by dots. Okay, just keep in mind that because we're talking about binary, each one of these actually represents eight bits. So if we have eight times four, that gives us our 32 bits for IP version four. For IP version six, it's actually four times that long. So with IP version six, we have, let's see if I can draw it out here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that's, I think that's right. Anyway, with IP version six, it's 128 bits long, much bigger addresses. 
IP version 6 addresses are not represented in dotted decimal. They're represented in a different way. We'll get to that in just one second. So an IP version 4 address, typically you'll see it something like this. Maybe uh, 120.17.32.1. Okay, so you know, 99% of your devices are accessing the internet or even just accessing your home network, whether it be your smartphone, your tablet, your PC, they have an IP version four address that resembles something like this. If you were to get into your operating system and look at it, it would be four decimal numbers separated by dots. And what makes this address special is that some of these numbers going from left to right indicate your particular network up to a point. So like, for example, maybe my network is 120.17, which means if that's my home Wi-Fi network, that means that my smart TV that has an IP address, that means my um, smartphone that's connected via Wi-Fi, that means my laptop that's connected via Wi-Fi, everything on my Wi-Fi network, when it gets an IP address, the first two characters will be the same, 120. Dot 17. That represents all the devices on my network. Now, if we're looking at just my laptop, my laptop is 120.17.32.1. That, the second part, is a unique identifier of my host. And we actually say in the world of IP version 4, we say that the first part of the address is the network portion. So everybody connected to that particular network will get that pattern. They will get that binary, that they will get that, that decimal number. And then the second part of the address is the host bits. That represents you as a unique individual on your network. Okay, now as far as IPv6 is concerned, let's just look at that for a second. IPv6 is uh, represented a little bit differently. Now this does not use decimal, Unfortunately, it uses something called hexadecimal, which uses both decimal characters and letters. So an IPv6 address looks something like this. 2001, and then instead of using dots to separate the numbers, they use colons. 2001 colon 1111 colon 0002 colon A1BC colon 1111 colon 2222, two, two, two. we need eight of these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so you can see much longer and it uses hexadecimal numbers instead of decimal. So we don't have time in this session to talk about the difference between hexadecimal and decimal, but the idea is the same. Of this, so this could be the IPv6 address on my laptop or on my smart TV or on my tablet, but the theory is still the same. Some part of this address, maybe this first portion here, will represent the network. And everything on my Wi-Fi network, when it gets an IPv6 address, will have this exact same pattern right here. And then this other part here represents me as a unique host. That represents like my laptop, for example. Now there's a little bit of a different naming convention though, even though in theory that the portions of the address represent the same thing. In the world of IPv4, the first part of the address was the network bits or the network portion. The second part of the address was the host bits or the host portion. In the world of IPv6, they said, well, the first part of the address, we're not gonna call it the network address anymore. Now we're gonna call it the prefix. It means exactly the same thing, just a different word. And the second part of the address, we're not gonna call that the host bits anymore. We're gonna call that the interface ID. The interface identifier. Still means exactly the same thing as the host bits. Okay, so that's what IPv4 and IPv6 addresses look like if you were to look at them. And here's a great way to look at them if you want to. And this is a, something you can download, an absolutely free tool that you can use. So if you go to, and I, if you haven't already downloaded something like this, I would highly encourage you to do this. If you go to wireshark.org, 
All right, so here you can download based on whatever your operating system is, this free program, this free application called Wireshark. You know, pick the op application you know, for Mac OS or, or Windows or whatever. And then once you've downloaded Wireshark and you start it up, all right, so this is the home screen when you start it up right here. So what Wireshark is, it's a tool that allows you to capture and display every single piece of data that's going in and out of your network interface card. Whether you've got a wireless network interface card for connecting to a Wi-Fi network or a wired interface card. Uh, so it'll, it'll display for you on the home screen here all of your various interfaces. A lot of these probably won't mean a whole lot to you, but you know if you see one that says Ethernet, that's a wired connector. So if you have like a laptop or a PC or a server with a wired ethernet connection, you would capture on that. But chances are you wanna capture on your Wi-Fi. I'll just capture here for a second. Okay, so each one of these horizontal lines represents data that my laptop is either sending or receiving. And it might not even be data that is coming from or going to my laptop because when you're connected to a network, you might be seeing data from other people that are on the same network as you. Um, so this might not even be for me or from me, but each of these horizontal lines represents what we call a packet. So in the world of the internet protocol, whether it be IPv4 or IPv6, the data that you're sending complete with the source and destination address is called a packet. So each one of these things is a packet and you can see under the source column here, this is where all these packets came from. So you can see the source IP address of these various things, and you can see the destination of where it's going, destination IP address. And then as you get a little bit more into your studies, you know, down below here, so for example, when you highlight a particular packet, you, you click it once to select it, then this section of Wireshark down here allows you to expand portions of that. So for example, this last little piece right here is the actual data. Now, I don't know what that is, you know, it's all just numbers, but everything above that are the various additional pieces of information we had to put in front of that data to get it onto the network and so the network would know what to do with it. And since we're talking about the internet protocol, here it is, IP version four, and we can see, this is all the stuff that the internet protocol added to my packet to help get it on its way. Now we're not gonna talk about all these different fields in here, but because we're talking about addressing, I wanna highlight, here we are at the end, IP adds the source address of where it's coming from and the destination address of where it's going to. Um, I don't know if my device is doing any IPv6 or not. Um, you would recognize IPv6 because it's a much different address. Actually, we could do this. Let's just see here. Another thing you can do with Wireshark is if you say, hey, uh, there's a particular field that I'm interested in. I wanna see all the packets that have that exact same field. Like for example, if I wanna see all packets that came from this source address, I could click it once to highlight it. I could right click it and then see right there where it says apply as filter. You could say apply as filter selected and now it has created what's called a display filter. It still has all the packets in the background that it captured, but now it's just displaying for you the packets you wanna see. So in this case, my display filter says, only show me packets where the IP source is equal to this particular number. Now in my case, I wanna see if I have any IP version six packets in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a filter for type IPv4 selected. And now I believe IPv6, if memory serves me, it's been a while since I've done this, is 86DD possibly. That's probably wrong. So you kind of have to know what you're filtering on. But I don't see any IPv6 in here at the moment. But look at this also, it's sort of interesting. When I captured this, I captured for literally like three or four seconds and that was it. And during that time, look at this massive quantity of packets that were captured. 
that gives you an idea of how much stuff your laptop is doing behind the scenes. But I digress. Okay, so now we know what IPv4 packets look like. Unfortunately, I don't see any IPv6 in here that I can show you. Yeah, we don't see any IPv6 in here. All right, so that gets us to our next question. Let's go back to, well, for example, let's look at this address right here, 52.86. I'll just write that down here. Actually, we don't have to look at that particular one. The point is, when a device, like your laptop, your PC, your server, obtains an IP address, when it first joins a network and gets an IP address, that laptop or device that knows, okay, of this number that I just got, let's just do it right here. Let's say my laptop or PC just got this address here, 20.86. 100.17.35. The next thing my device would need to know is it says, okay, that's an IP address. I know that some portion of this tells me the network I'm on and the rest of it is my unique host ID. But how do I know where that line ends? In other words, is the network I'm on and every single device on my network starting with 20? and then my unique host ID is 100.17.35, or is the network I'm on 20.100, and everybody on it starts with 20.100, how do I know? And you might be wondering, well, why do you care? You know, why does your laptop care? Well, here's the reason it cares. Because when a device, laptop, smartphone, tablet, is creating data to send, and then it puts an IP address on that data of where it's coming from itself, and where it's going to, the very next question that device has to ask is, is this data destined for something on my network or is it destined for something not on my network? And how it answers that question determines what happens next. You see, if, if, the, if I'm trying to reach something that's on the very same network as me, for example, if, if my laptop doing Wi-Fi was trying to send data to my printer which is also connected to the same Wi-Fi network as me, how I would send data to that printer, how I would talk to it would be very different than if my laptop was trying to send data to google.com or ine.com, which is not on my network. So that raises the question, when a device says, okay, this is me, source 110.1.2.1, and the destination I'm trying to reach is 110.3.17.5. Now that source has to say, is that destina destination I'm trying to reach on my network or on a completely different network? Because if, if it's on a completely different network, your host says, I need to send this information to my gateway, to my router which might be a Linksys router or a little Wi-Fi router, but I need to send it to my router because I don't know where the other networks are. They could be across the street, they could be 5,000 miles away. I have no idea. So when I'm trying to get something off my network, I send it to my router and I figure, he'll figure out what to do with it. My router will know how to send it from there. So how do I figure this out? Well, an IP address by itself would not answer that question. An IP address by itself does not give you any clue as to what portion of that number represents your network and what portion of it represents you as a unique host. That's why IP addresses come along with something called a subnet mask. And once again, this is true of both IP version four and IP version six addresses. They both have to have a subnet mask. And the subnet mask, which is another number, for example, maybe the subnet mask that came along with my source address was this, 255.255.0.0. Now, subnet masks, when we write them as humans and we look at them in the output of the commands, they are displayed as dotted decimal numbers, just like your IP address itself is a dotted decimal number. But just keep in mind, the way computers and laptops view it, is as a binary number. It's also a 32-bit number of ones and zeros, 32 ones and zeros long. 
So this subnet mask is used as a comparison tool against the IP address itself. And in this particular case, the way this works is when you take a look at your subnet mask, and we'll just, we'll just keep this, this easy for the purposes of, of this webinar here. Each one of these numbers in the subnet mask has a range. It could be from zero up to 255. That's the range that you could see. Now we'll just keep it easy and keep them as either zeros or 255s because when the numbers are in the middle of that, it, it gets a little bit more complex. So let's uh, give myself a little bit more space here to draw this. Okay, so if I had an IP address like the one I gave myself here, 110.1.2.1, and if I put my subnet mask directly below that, 255.255.0.0. Okay, so each number each decimal number in the subnet mask is compared to the number just above it in the IP address. And we're gonna make it simple here. If the number in the subnet mask is the number 255, that means the number directly above it is part of your network address. So in this particular case, and if the number is zero, that means the number above it is your host identifier, your host bits. So if this is my IP address right here, and this is the subnet mask that I have that goes along with it, this subnet mask tells my laptop, tells my device that, hey, the network that you are on is the 110.1 network. Because the first number 110 is part of your network bits that corresponds to 255 in the subnet mask, and the next number of one corresponds to your network bits. So everything on my Wi-Fi network, my laptop, my printer, everything, when it gets an IP address, would that, the IP address would start with 110.1. And because these numbers here corresponded to zeros in my subnet mask, that means these are my host bits. So I am on the 110.1 network, as is everything else on my Wi-Fi network, and my unique identifier, my unique host identifier on this network is 2.1. Okay, so let's go back to my original example here of where I, this is my source, 110.1.2.1, and I need to send a packet, I need to send some data to 110.3.17.5. Now remember I said every packet that's created, the laptop or PC or smartphone says, okay, is this destination I'm trying to get to on the same network as me? Or is it not on the same network as me? Do I need to send this to my router to get it on its way? Well, now my source says, okay, I know that based on my subnet mask, if I was gonna send it to a destination that's on the same network that I'm on, that destination address would begin with 110.1, just like me. But oh, look at this. The destination I'm going to is not 110.1, it's 110.3. So that's not my network. I have no idea where that is. That could be around the globe for as far as I know. So now my laptop or PC knows I need to, once I've created this packet, I need to send it to my router and my router will get it on its way. So that's the purpose of subnet mask and every IP version four and every IP version six address has to have a subnet mask along with it. Otherwise the device that contains that address has no way of knowing what portion of that address is the network that it's on and what portion of the address is its own host identifier. Okay, and as far as IPv6 is concerned, let me just uh, draw this right here. This might be a little bit faster. So an IPv6 address might look like 2001 AAAA, 3333-0020 or whatever, 9929-A34F-7777 and I need eight of these groupings here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
right there. And then the subnet mass, so notice that this is not in dotted decimal, right? I mentioned that IPv6 is in hexadecimal. Well, the subnet mask is right after it with a slash and then a number, like slash 64. So in this case, we know that from here to here is 128 bits, 128 bits long. So slash 64 tells that that's one half of 128, right? So that means that we are divided right here in the middle. So that means this portion, all these things represent my prefix. So everything on my IPv6 network, my printer, my um, laptop, they will all get IPv6 addresses beginning with this pattern, 2001 all the way to 9929. And this portion here after the first 64 bits is my interface ID. That belongs to me, my unique laptop. So the takeaway from here is that with both IPv4 and IPv6, it's a number. The numbers are represented a little bit differently between V4 and V6, but it's a number. And that number is divided somewhere with a line where the first part of the number represents the network of the prefix. The second part of the number represents you as a unique identity, as a unique host or interface. And where we find that line is by looking at the subnet mask that goes along with the IP address. Okay, uh, some additional things about IP. And let's just, um, well, we'll keep doing IPv4 and IPv6. I'll just say V4 and V6. Okay, so in the world of both IPv4 and IPv6, there are different kinds of IP addresses. For example, if I'm going to create a packet that has either an IPv4 or an IPv6 source address, and my goal, my intent, is to send that packet off of my network onto the internet, like to ine.com, google.com, whatever, Okay, well then that means that my source address and the destination of where it's going has to be unique. In other words, if my source address was let's say 10.0.0.1 and if there was some other network out there like my neighbor's network or maybe a network in the next state that all, and let's say that because of my subnet mask, let's say my subnet mask said, hey, your network is 10.0. That's the network you're on, Keith. Well, if there was another network anywhere else in the world, anywhere else, that was also the 10.0 network, okay, well, yeah, I could get my packet to you, the destination. Hey, Bob, you know, I want to talk to you, and, and I'm coming from 10.0.0.1, so my packet would get to you, but what would happen when you replied to it? If you send a reply back to 10.0.0.1, once your packet entered the internet, you know, the routers on the internet would say, oh, we're a little confused here because if we're gonna send a packet to 10.0.0.1, well, we see the 10.0 network over there in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we also see the 10.0 network over there in Boise, Idaho, and a few other places too. So because it was not a unique network, it couldn't get back to me. So in the world of IP addresses, both V4 and V6, IP addresses are divided into public and private addresses. Um, now we have different words for that. In V4, we call them public addresses. And in V6, we call them global addresses. But the meaning is the same. That means that this particular network is unique. Wherever this network was assigned, whether it was assigned to Keith's house, the INE.com office in Cary, the Google office in Seattle, you know, whatever, that network only exists there. It doesn't exist anywhere else. That's the meaning of a public or a global address. That means that that network is only in one place. As opposed to, Let's say I had a, a little home lab here, right? I, I had my own rack of equipment. I had some servers and PCs plugged into that equipment. They were gonna be creating IP packets, but all the packets created in that lab were only gonna stay in that lab. 
They were never going to go out to the public internet. They were just going to stay right here in my room. Well, then in that case, I don't need a public IPv4 or a global IPv6 prefix for that little lab network. I could just use one from the private space. In the world of IPv6, they don't call them private. They call them unique local. Unique local addresses. All right. So some, IPv, some IP addresses are meant to be only in one place in the whole world. And the whole world knows exactly where that network is. We call those public or global addresses. Other networks are intentionally designed to be used by anybody at any point, as long as you don't send packets into the internet using those, because there's no way you could get those packets back because they're all over the place. Those are called private or unique local. Now, how do you recognize them? If I was to show you an IPv4 or an IPv6 address and I was to ask you, which of these is it? How would you know? Well, in the world of IPv4, Let's just start with the private addresses because it's actually easier to identify those. In the world of IPv4, private IP addresses fall into three different ranges. Anytime you see an IP address that begins with 10 dot anything, we don't care what the remaining bits are, or 172.16 dot anything through 172.16 dot 31 dot anything or 192.168 dot anything. Those are all private IPv4 addresses. Okay. So if your device, your laptop, your printer, whatever, has an IP address that's in one of those groupings there, that's good for your own home network, but you could never use that as a source or destination address if you're trying to send a packet into the global internet. It just wouldn't work. Now, as, our, as far as IPv6 is concerned, that's a lot easier. Anytime you see an IPv6 address beginning with either FC anything or FD anything. Now, I'll use the word private, but technically we would call those unique local. You know, the older term was site local, means the same thing. Can't use that to send packets to or from the internet. That's only meant for your own private networks, FC or FD. Okay, what about your, your public addresses? How do you recognize those? All right, well, in let's stay with IPv6 to begin with. IPv6 public addresses or global addresses are very easy to, to look at. Basically, any address that begins with the number two. Now, there's one or two addresses that sort of fall outside the scope of that, but if you ever see an IPv6 address that begins with two, anything, that is a global address. Just starts with the number two. There you go, real simple. IPv4, uh, it's a little bit tougher to spot those. So with IPv4, there's actually a lot. So anything beginning with one dot anything through nine dot anything. And then of course we can't include the tens, right? So then that would take us up through 11 dot anything through 126 dot anything. We skip 127 and now we go to 128 and I'll just, to make it simple, go up to 223 dot anything. There's still a, a handful in the middle here that you can't use. But you get the idea that if you're trying to identify a global, or I should say a public IPv4 address, if I gave you an IP address and I said, is this a public address or not? It would be probably easier to twist that question around and answer it from the perspective of, well, is it a private address? Because you know, I can memorize these pretty easily. If, if I show you an IPv4 address and you say, mm, that's not private, and as, and as long as it's not above 223, it's probably a public address. 
that can be routed publicly on the internet, most likely. IPv6, you can see real easy to find that out. Hey, does it start with a two? Boop, you're done. If it does, yep, that's a globally public address. If it starts with FC or FD, boop, you're done. That is a private address, what we call unique local. All right. So those are um, some types of IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, public and private. Another kind of address that you will see used uh, in the world of IPv4, not in IPv6, is the broadcast address. Forgive my slappy, sloppy writing here, broadcast address. So a lot of times there are certain protocols and applications that you can start up in your laptop, server, PC, whatever, and that one of the first things that application or protocol will do is it'll try to discover something. It'll basically send a packet onto the network sort of shouting out saying, hey, is, is there a service out there that does this for me? Or is there somebody out there that can do this? Now in that particular case, when you're trying to discover something, you don't necessarily know what the destination IP address is. That might actually be what you're trying to discover, for example. Maybe you join a network for the first time and your device says, okay, um, I don't know if there's a router on this network. I know I need one, but I don't know if one exists. Well, your device, your laptop, your server, your smartphone might invoke a protocol that sends out what's called a broadcast onto the network saying, hey, everybody on this network, is one of you a router? If so, let me know what your IP address is so I can speak with you directly. Now we know that whenever you put anything onto a network, right, here's your data. So that might be where you're doing your shout. Hey, is there a router out there? Let me know who you are. And then we know that you gotta put an IP header on that among other things. And we know that the IP header is gonna contain your source address of who you are, which might be uh, 20.1.1.1. And we know you have to put a destination on there destination IP address. But what do you put in that field if you don't know what the destination is? If you're just shouting out to the whole network, you put in a broadcast address. Now, there's two general types of broadcast. The ones that people are probably most likely to see is what's called a general broadcast. And the general broadcast takes a very familiar pattern, which is 255.255.255.255. So if you opened up Wireshark one of these days and you captured a bunch of packets and you saw that one of the packets was going to this address, all 255s, that is called the general broadcast address. That, is, that address is reserved for this purpose, to shout out, to the entire network, to the entire world, basically, is somebody out there that I'm looking for. That's called the general broadcast. Now, a lesser known type of broadcast is something called a directed broadcast. Okay. Now keep in mind, when you send out a packet to this destination, the theory is this is going everywhere. Now you might say, whoa, wait a second. Does that mean if I send a packet to that, it's gonna go all the way to Russia and China and Hawaii and every place else? No, it won't. Because when routers, you know, your Cisco router, your Linksys router, you know, whatever router you have, when a router receives a packet going to that destination, that general broadcast, the router will look inside the data and they'll say, okay, is somebody trying to find me? Are they asking about me? If the answer is yes, then the router will respond saying, here I am, here's what you're looking for. If the answer is no, the router will say, okay, they're not looking for me, I'm gonna kill this packet, I'm gonna drop it. So general broadcasts like this go no further than your router, okay? They don't go beyond that. The directed broadcast is a broadcast that is intentionally designed only to talk to all the devices on your network and that's it, just your network. 
So let's say, for example, that, well, let's use this example here, 20.111. Let's say that that was my IP address, and the subnet mask that I had along with that was this. Okay? So remember, the way you do that is you compare each one of these numbers with its corresponding decimal number in the IP address. In this case, because of my dotted decimal number in my mask, because the first three of them are 255s, that means the first three digits of my IP address belong to my network. So that means that everybody on my network is 20.11, and only the very last number is uniquely for me. I'm dot one. Maybe my printer is dot five. Maybe my you know, IP phone is dot six. All right. Let's say I want to send a directed broadcast to everybody just in my network. Well, then I would send it to this. 20.1.1. That's my network. And then in the host portion, the host bits portion, I would put 255. Because in the world of IPv4, okay, in the world of IPv4, let's, uh, and here I'll just say network, network, and then 255, 255. So you, do, you keep the network portion in a directed broadcast to whatever the network happens to be, and then you fill out all the host bits with 255. And the reason why it, it works this way, let me just do it like this, is if we were actually breaking down an IPv4 address into its binary, into its ones and zeros, I'm not gonna do all 32 bits here, but you know, I haven't counted that up. Maybe that is 32 bits. Let's say that my subnet mask indicated that these bits here were the network portion. All right, so my, maybe my network in binary in ones and zeros looks like this. All right, so maybe all the devices on my network start out with that binary pattern. And then this, these are the host bits. Well, in the world of IPv4, these host bits can be any combination of zeros and ones, except they cannot be all zeros, and they cannot be all ones. Not for a host. In other words, if I'm going to take a host like a laptop or an IP phone, IP camera, whatever, tablet, and I'm going to put an IP address on that device, I'm going to make sure that IP address, the first part of it, matches whatever the network is. And then the second part of it is going to be some combination of zeros and ones. I cannot put on that host an address where the host bits are all zeros or all ones because those two patterns means something special. This one right here means broadcast. So in binary, if I was to create an IP packet and the destination address of that IP packet looked like this, where I said, okay, this is the destination network and I use that as the host bits, that would be a directed broadcast. That would mean this packet is going to all hosts in this network. That's why this pattern here can't be used on any one individual host because it's not meant for that. It's a reserved value for everybody called the broadcast. This pattern here of all zeros is reserved for the network. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, let's say that my IP address was 20.1.17.50, okay? And then I told you that my subnet mask was 255.255.255.0. Okay, so with that subnet mask, since the first three characters, the first three digits are 255, 255, 255, that means the network and everybody on it has an IP address starting with 20.1.17, okay? Now, if you were to ask me, Keith, what is the address of your network? What's, what's the address of everybody on your network? Not any one particular host. Technically, it would not be correct for me to say 
20.1.17. I couldn't say my network is 20.1.17 because if I said that, you say, ah, well, Keith, I've been studying IP addresses and I know that IP addresses are four characters separated by dots. You only gave me three. What's up? So if I'm gonna be technical, I'd have to say, well, the IP address of the network is 20.1.17. Dot zero. And you see here, now all the host bits are zeroed out. So when all the host bits are zeroed out, that is not, you can't give that to a laptop or a PC. That represents the network as a whole, as a whole. And the same thing is true with IPv6 networks. If I was to give you an IPv6 network like this, 2001, 1111, 2222, If that was the prefix, so if I said this is my address, well, with a slash 64, that means that the first half of the address, because remember, 120 bits total, that's my prefix. So if all my host bits are zeroed out, that is not an address that belongs to any one particular host. That's an address that belongs to the whole network. Okay. All right, and so um, also the next thing I wanna talk about is, okay, so now we know what the, the structure of IPv4 and IPv6 addresses look like. We know how to identify public and private addresses in both v4 and v6, we've talked about that. Uh, we've talked about what the broadcast address is. By the way, in the world of v6, IPv6, there is no broadcast address. IPv6 does not have the concept of broadcast. And we've also talked about what a subnet mask is and how a subnet mask is very important to an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. We've covered all that. Now, the next logical question you might be wondering is, okay, my laptop, my smartphone, um, how did it get that address? Where does an IPv4, IPv6 address actually come from? Because I didn't type it in. Well, in the world of IPv4, there are two primary ways the device could obtain an IPv4 address. If we're talking about um, a host device like a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet or something, most likely it obtained its address dynamically. because you know you didn't go in there and type in the IP address. And the other thing is, you know, as if you're talking about a mobile device, you know, a device that you can pick up and move from network to network to network, your IP address will change, right? The IP address you have on your laptop right now is valid because that's the network you're in. But if you pick up that laptop and you move to another conference room or another building or even another store, you're not in that original network anymore, are you? Now you've moved to a different network so your network bits, your network portion has to change to represent the network you're now sitting in. So mobile devices typically have dynamic addresses and there's actually a protocol out there called DHCP. DHCP, which stands for the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. This is what IPv4 hosts use when they first connect to a network to dynamically obtain their IP address, their subnet mask, and other things as well. Like they use this to get the address of their router, their default gateway, DHCP. Now, if you're talking about a device like a server that's sort of fixed and static and is always gonna be in one network and it needs an address that's predictable, that people know what exactly it is, well, then you give a static IP address. All right, so that means that you, you went into the NIC card settings or something of that device and you typed in manually the IP address and the subnet mask, static address. Now in the world of V6, IPv6, okay, there is DHCP V6. So there's an IPv6 equivalent of DHCP that exists. And certainly you can statically assign an IPv6 address 
to the NIC card of something, you can do that. And then IPv6 also has a method that IPv4 doesn't have. It's called SLAC, S-L-A-A-C. Of course, that's an acronym. That stands for stateless, stateless address automatic configuration. Stateless address automatic configuration. This is really cool in concept. Basically what this is, is when an IPv6 device first connects to an IPv6 network, if it's using Slack, it'll send out a message saying, hey, is there a router out there? I need to know who you are. The router will respond back. And when the router responds back, the router will give its own IPv6 address. Now you know who your IPv6 router is. The router will also tell you what the IPv6 network or prefix is that's in use on your network. So now your laptop knows, okay, I know who my router is, got that. And of IPv6, I know what the prefix is on this network because the router told me that he and everybody else on this network is using this particular prefix. And then with stateless address automatic configuration, your device will dynamically come up with its interface ID on its own. So those are the three ways with IPv6 that you can get your own IP address. Okay, so now you've got an IP address for your, yourself, right? You most likely use DHCP or DHCPv6 to get your address, great. Now the next question is, how do I know what the address is of who I wanna go to, right? Like for example, let's say I bring up my browser and I wanna see the webpage of ine.com, okay? Well, that means I need, I need to be able to send a packet to the destination IP address of ine.com and say, hey, show me your webpage, display it for me. But before I do that, I need to know what the address is of ine.com. Well, the protocol for that is this. It's called DNS, the Domain Name Service. So when you first join an IPv4 or an IPv6 network, you're most likely doing DHCP. Could be V6 if you're talking about IPv6. And when you do DHCP, what you're gonna learn is my IP address, my subnet mask, my router, I'll learn his address, and I'll learn the IP address of a DNS server. Okay. Some very popular ones that are out there right now and that are publicly accessible are uh, Google has one that a lot of people use and its IP address is 8888. You'll see that one. Uh, there's another one which is I think it's called Cloudflare. I, I'm not sure who owns it off the top of my head, but it's 1.1.1.1. So you'll probably see those numbers a lot. Those are publicly accessible DNS servers. Now, what's DNS used for? Okay, so I've got that information now. I got that from DHCP. I open up my browser and I type in INE.com. Okay, what my laptop will do is it will create a packet with itself as the source, and let's say I'm using uh, Google's DNS server, 8888. So that will be the destination IP address. So I'll be sending a packet to a server out, the, out there in the internet that's owned by Google, a DNS server. And in the, in the body of that packet, I'll be saying, hey, DNS server, I'm looking for the IP address of INE.com. Do you happen to know what that is? And then the DNS server will send a packet back to me saying, oh yes, INE.com is you know 155.7.2.2. Now I've got my destination. So that's typically, you know, 99% of the time, how your host device, your smartphone, your laptop, your tablet, will discover what the destination is that you're trying to get to. You as a human being will type in some human readable name like INE.com, WRAL.com, FoxNews.com, whatever it is. And then in order to translate that human readable name into an IP address, your laptop will send out a message to the DNS server that it learned via DHCP and the DNS server will respond back, giving you 
the public IP address of that destination you're trying to reach. All right. Um, the last thing I'm going to cover very briefly is sort of the high level concept of subnetting, because after all, the, this webinar was titled Demystifying IP Addresses and Subnetting. So let's just cover that real quickly. Let's say that you own a small company. All right. So, and your company is going to need four separate networks. Maybe you've got one network that you're going to need for human resources, another network you're going to need for payroll, another network for marketing, and another network for engineering. Okay. So we need four unique distinct networks. Now you might be saying, well, why can't I just put them all on one network? You absolutely could. You could put all these on one network. You could say, hey, everybody in my company, you're all gonna have IP addresses beginning with 20.1. And then you all have unique host IDs after that. Here's the problem with that. If every device, every printer, every IP phone, every laptop in my company is on the exact same network, it makes security kind of hard. Like, do I really want my engineering people to have complete access to everything in payroll, right? Do, do I want them, do I want marketing to have access to everything that engineering's doing? Probably not. You probably want to impl Im impose some sort of network restriction saying that, you know, packets from this part of the network are not allowed to go over here to this other part of the network. Well, if everybody was in one big network, you can do that. There's features and mechanisms for that, but it's tricky. It's hard. It's a lot easier if you divide your network up into your company into multiple networks, because then the features, there's a lot very easy features to use to say, hey, packets from HR network, it can go to payroll, but it's not allowed to go to engineering. Okay, there's, so dividing your company up into multiple networks makes that a lot easier. Okay, so we know I need four networks now. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is where do I get my network, right? Where do I go for that? Most companies will go to their friendly neighborhood internet service provider, like Time Warner Cable, Spectrum, Charter Communications, whoever it is. And they'll say, hey, Charter, Spectrum, I'm willing to pay you some money every single month if you will give me a network. Now, I could go to my ISP and say, hey, I need four networks, and they would be happy to give me that. But remember, every network you get from your ISP, from your service provider, is gonna incur a charge. So the more networks I get from them, the higher my bill's gonna be, which they will be perfectly happy to take my money, but is there a way around that? Well, let's look at this. Let's say I went to my ISP and I said, hey, because I know a little bit about subnetting here, and I say, I just need one network. And my ISP says, okay, um, here's our router right here, connecting to you. That's our router. And we will give you, well, let's say this, 20.1. So our router, let's say that this is interface number five on the router. The interface, the router's got lots of interfaces. Our router has a routing table and that routing table knows that 20.1.0.0 with a subnet mask of this is off of interface five. So that means if they ever get any packets from the internet coming into them, their router will look it up on the routing table and if those packets if the destination is 20.1, because that's what this mask says, if it's going to 20.1, send those packets out, interface number five. And then they're gonna advertise to the rest of the world. All the other ISPs are gonna say, hey, AT&T, Sprint, you know, whatever. If you need to get to the 20.1 network, come to us, we own it. Okay, so from the ISP's perspective, 20.1, is what has been allocated to my business, my company. But that's one network. If I had that mask, if I kept that mask, 
If I said, hey, everybody in engineering, payroll, HR, you are 20.1 and your mask is 255.255.0.0. Well, then I'm just left with everybody being in one network. But here's what I can do. I know that all my devices in my company have to start with 20.1 because after all, that's what I bought and paid for. That's how the ISP recognizes me. But I could subdivide this into smaller networks because remember, remember what the subnet mask does, right? The subnet mask tells a, a host device where the networking bits end and where the host bits begin. So subnetting says, hey, why don't we give everybody, all four of these networks, HR, payroll, engineering, and marketing, a different subnet mask? Why don't we say that everybody here is gonna have this subnet mask? If I give everybody that subnet mask, and now I say, hey, HR, Every device in HR is going to begin with 20.1. Let's say four. Everybody in payroll is going to be 20.1.5. Engineering is going to be dot six, and marketing is going to be dot seven. Well, if all those devices, when they get their various IP addresses, see they've gotten this IP address, well, now, right, Sally right here, who's in HR who is 20.1.4. something, when she wants to send a packet to um, Bob over here in engineering, Sally is going to believe that Bob is in a completely different network because he is, right? Sally's going to say, my network based on my subnet mask is 21.4. I'm trying to send a packet to 21.6. That's a different pattern than me. Those first three numbers are not the same as my first three numbers. So I need to send that packet to my router. Maybe the router's right here that's connecting all these guys. This router has four interfaces. So now I received one network, but by fiddling with the subnet mask, I have now subdivided that one network into four subnetworks. I can actually get a lot more subnetworks than this, but I'm just showing you here that, you know, as long as you keep the initial bits the same, right? I have to stay with 20.1. So the first two numbers in my subnet mask cannot change. Everybody has to be 20.1. But there's nothing forcing me to keep these bits as host bits. I can now change. So in my example with subnetting, I said, hey, this number right here, although the ISP considers that to be host bits, I'm gonna turn those into networking bits by flipping them on with my subnet mask. And that now allows me to come up with a whole bunch of combinations of networks that all begin with 20.1. That's the idea of subnetting, is taking one large network and carving it up into multiple smaller networks, all of which have the initial starting network as the same. All right, so I think that's a good stopping point for us here. We've talked about different types of IP addresses. We did some sniffer traces here. We looked at subnet mass. We did a lot of comparisons between IPv4 and IPv6. And uh, we finished up by doing a, a brief, you know, high level look at what subnetting is. So I think that is a good place for us to stop. So based on that, uh, let me go into the Q&A at this point and see what questions you guys have. All right, so uh, Saeed, I see your question there asking if in the future we can have some sort of a, a deeper dive session for IPv6 and maybe some migration plans from IPv4 to IPv6. Certainly we could do that in the future. Um, anything's possible. So yeah, we, we could certainly do that. So right now I'll say tentatively, yes, we will have that. We will put down the calendar at some point in the near future. All right, uh, let's see here. Okay, Adam 
asks a question about what about ARPA addresses. Adam, uh, if you could be a little bit more clear, I'm not familiar with that term ARPA addresses. Um, I have not heard of that before. I'm sure it exists. I'm just not familiar with it. So if you could provide a little bit more context around that, then that might trigger something in my memory and I might be able to answer that. But, but right now, I, I don't have any answer for that one. Uh, Lucas asks a really good question. If IPv6 gives us a lot of addresses to use, do we need to use NAT in the future? Well, technically the answer would be no, we don't. Um, but let's think about it from a different perspective. We know that, you know, in this session here, I talked about public and private addresses, right? And I said that uh, when the designers of IPv6 came up with their addressing scheme, they said, well, we're gonna reserve the patterns of FC anything and FD anything for basically private networks. Now that would raise an interesting question in my mind, which is if there's so much IPv6 addressing space around, why would we need private networks? Clearly there must have been a need, otherwise they would not have come up with this, right? So if you can envision a situation where you say, all right, in my company, I need these networks over here to have private addresses beginning with FC or FD. You know, I've got some business requirement for that, okay? Then you need to use FC or FD. But if those same private networks also need to reach the public internet, then we would still need some sort of network address translation to translate their private source addresses of FC and FD into some sort of public address before it left for the internet. But certainly, if every single network you have in your company is using the public addressing space, and there's plenty of that to go around, technically there is no need for network address translation. So the only thing I can think of where network address translation would be necessary is if you've got the situation where you've got some private IPv6 address space that needs to be translated into public address space. I'm not sure how often you'll see something like that. All right. And see here, what else? Um, Robert asked a real quick question about saying, can you explain wildcard masks and their calculation? Um, I can really, really quickly. Now, this isn't really something that goes into IP addressing and subnetting, but you know how I mentioned that, you know, an IP, an IP address, let's just stick with IPv4, for example, is 32 bits long. And let's just say each one of these represents 32 bits, you know, in an IP address. I haven't counted those up. It's probably close to 32 bits. And I said, okay, well, we need something else just below that called a subnet mask that is compared bit by bit to our IP address. I'm trying to line these up here. So let's say my IP address looked like this. So we're talking binary, not, not decimal. And let's say the subnet mass that came along with that looked like this. Once again, in binary. And with a subnet mask, you've always have some continuous or contiguous line of ones followed by a continuous line of zeros. So we know that the way the subnet mask works is that each one of these mask bits is compared to a bit in my IP address. And if the subnet masking bit is a one, that means the corresponding bit in the IP address is a networking bit. So based on this subnet mask, this portion of my IP address is my network portion. The rest are host bits. Well, a wildcard mask is basically just the inverse of a subnet mask. So if, if, for example, I was using some sort of a feature and in that feature that I was using, I was to say, hey, 
Um, what I want you to look for, I'm gonna give you a pattern. You know, here's a pattern right here. But the bits I really want you to pay attention to, the bits that are important to me, are these bits right here. So when a packet comes in, match those sort of bits in the middle. The bits in front of it, the bits after it, I don't care. They could be any combination of ones and zeros, I don't care. But I want these bits, these, these five bits here, to be one, zero, 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 one. Now lots of IP packets could have that pattern, but that's what I'm looking for. Well then, we would need some sort of comparison tool, like we had a subnet mask, that could do a bit by bit comparison for us just like that. But a subnet mask doesn't work for that. This is where a wildcard mask comes into play. So with a wildcard mask, you would put a zero in the wildcard mask to say, okay, these bits right here have to exactly match. So if a bit in my pattern, which is my IP address in this case, matches a zero bit in my wildcard mask, that pattern has to match exactly. And if a bit in my IP address, my pattern, matches a one bit in the wildcard mask, that means these bits could be anything. I don't care if there's zeros or ones. So, so in general, a wildcard mask is a more specific way to match on certain bit patterns within your IP address. Now this is a really weird wildcard mask right here because we got some ones followed by zeros followed by ones. A lot of wildcard masks you'll actually see will look sort of like a subnet mask but just the opposite. You'll have some zeros followed by 255s or something like that. Right, you'll have a long continuous range of zeros the zeros will end followed by a long continuous range of ones in binary. But I'm just saying that the power of a wildcard mask is it doesn't have to look like that. You could have your zeros and ones anywhere because the zeros are saying match that bit. Whatever that bit is, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And the one means I don't care. It could be any pattern of zero or one. So that's how a wildcard mask is constructed and used. Okay, so uh, let's see here, what else do we have? Jacob asked a question, he says, uh, do, you use a, do you use a method to quickly turn binary into decimal for IPv4? Your personal method maybe. It's, it's really just practice. It's just practice over and over and over again. Um, there's not a lot of shortcuts you can take when it comes to that. So the nice thing is, is that even though an IP address is a 32-bit number in binary, right? So, so technically, if my IP address was something like this, I'm not going to fill it all out, but you get the idea. If that was my IP address, I could technically say my IP address is is 5,106,203. Because if we converted this big, massive binary number into its decimal, that could very well be what it is. But the developers of IP said, no, you're, you know, when you come up with the decimal equivalent of this, that's not the way you're gonna do it. They said, look, we're gonna use dotted decimal, where each of the, each eight bits, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we're gonna separate with dots. So you're gonna have you know, four groupings of this. I'm, I'm gonna run out of room here before I do it. So, and in binary, an, an eight bit number is a lot easier to work with. Let's just do it like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so an eight bit number in binary, the first, if it's, the first one is your ones position, so if you've got a, a one there, that means one. Your second one is in the twos position, which, you know, so if I have a one there, that's 
the two bit is turned on and the one bit's turned on. So that equals three, right? The next, and then we just keep multiplying by two. Binary is base two. So this is the fours, eights, 16s, 32s, 64s, and 128s. So in binary, if, if this was my IP address, okay, and if, let's just take this byte right here, if this byte translate in binary to this number, like that, okay, if I saw that binary number, I would just have to, and you know, you just get good at this after doing it for over and over and over again. I would just say, okay, well, looking at this, all I care about are the ones where the one is turned on. So which ones have ones turned on? Well, I've got the 64, that's turned on. I've got the eight turned on. I've got the two turned on, and I have the one bit turned on. So I would just add those up. 64 plus eight is 72, plus three gives me 75. Oops, not sure what happened there. So that number in binary is 75. And that just comes from you know, adding up these values over and over and over again. Unfortunately, I don't know of any faster way to, to do that binary to decimal conversion. And of course, there's calculators to do it, right? But uh, you, you should know how to do this in your head. All right, what else do we have? Thank you, Jacob, for that question. Ah, okay, Adam. All right, thank you for clarifying. So Adam is asking about the APIPA address, the automatically provisioned IP address. What is that? All right, sure, we can talk about that. Automatically provisioned IP address. Okay, you know how I mentioned that, that the vast majority of your devices, like your tablet, your smartphone, your laptop, that when it connects to a network, it invokes DHCP, right? It sends out a DHCP broadcast saying, hey, is there a DHCP server out there somewhere? Because if there is, I need some IP information. What network am I on? What's my host address? Who's my router? Now, what if DHCP fails, right? What if the, you can't get to the DHCP server or maybe the DHCP server is unresponsive? Well, a lot of operating systems they will invoke DHCP and they're not gonna wait forever. If, if DHCP fails after 20 or 30 seconds, then the operating system will give up and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna automatically provision myself with the IP address of 169.254. And then the last two numbers, it'll just dynamically determine for itself. So 169.254, anytime you see that, that should make you say, hmm, that's a problem. I need to troubleshoot that. That, is the, that indicates that you have an automatically provisioned IP address, which nine times out of 10 means that DHCP failed. You couldn't get your DHCP server to respond. You gave up and you automatically gave yourself some sort of automatically provisioned IP address, 169.254, maybe 1.7 or something. I, I think the idea behind this was that, um, let's take a gaming environment, for example, right? Let, let's say I, I invite a bunch of friends over to my house. I've got a little switch or a little hub and all of us plug our laptops into that hub, right? And then we're gonna play some sort of uh, online multiplayer game amongst each other that involves us being on the same network. Well, all of our laptops by default are gonna do DHCP DHCP will fail because we don't have a DHCP server on this. It's just a bunch of laptops and a server or a switch. And so then all of us will fall back to an IP, an automatically provisioned IP address of 169.254. So in theory, we should all be able to communicate now because we'll be 169.254 dot something. Now, is there a chance that, that my friend and I could end up with these exact same two numbers on the back end? Possible. I don't know how operating systems randomly determine what numbers should go here, um, but this is such a, a big space that it's probably unlikely. So now all of us laptops connect to that switch will have some sort of an IP address. We're all in the same network and we can play our game. 
But usually a 169, 254 address is an indication of a problem that you need to troubleshoot a little bit further. All right, what else do we have? Uh, Nasser asked, do you offer any training for Nokia 7750 routers? No, I am afraid we do not. I haven't seen anything like that on the platform. Uh, Mohammed asks, I got my CCNE routing and switching in 2019. How easy do you think it will be to get the new CCNP Enterprise Encore exam? Oh, well, I will tell you that there is a huge jump between what you have to learn to pass the old CCNA and even the current CCNA and what you need to know to pass the Encore exam. Big jump. Um, keep in mind that, you know, Last year, 2019, you had sort of three levels of gradation, right? You had the, the CCNA, and then you had a little bit of a jump to get to the CCNP level. And then from the CCNP level, the next thing would be your CCIE written exam, right? And there was quite a big jump between CCNP and CCIE written. A lot of new topics that you never would have touched before. Well, now the CCNP Encore exam is basically the new CCIE written exam. It's used for that purpose. So they've sort of taken out that middle step and now you go from CCNA up to basically the CCIE written. It's just they call it Encore. So can it be done? Absolutely. But just be aware that there's a whole lot of new topics you'll have to learn for Encore and a lot more depth of topics of what you already learned for CCNA to get there. Um, so I would, pr I would plan on at least a good year of studying if, uh, before you attempt that. Thanks for asking though. Okay. And uh, Masa asked a good question. When do you, we use a slash 31? Okay, uh, so just to answer that question real briefly, when you have two devices, typically two routers that are connected back to back via cable. Uh, remember how I said that, let's do this here. I said that if, if my network is, let's just stick with 20.1 since that's what I've been using. Let's say 20.1.1, let's say that's my network address. So my subnet mask so far is this. All right, and let's say I have a cable. So that's where that network is gonna go and I have two devices on that cable, right? Device A and device B. Okay, well, we know that they're both gonna need IP addresses that begin with 20.1.1 because they're both connected to the same wire, the same network. Um, <clears throat> now, if I keep their subnet mask as this, okay, well then remember, this is relating to the last eight bits of that last byte. Okay, so, and we know that the combination of all ones can't be used in normal settings, and the combination of zeros, all zeros can't be used in normal settings. But that gives us everything in the middle, which in this particular case uh, gives us 254 no, that's not right. Uh, yeah, 254. 254 combinations. 254 combos. So I could say, all right, well, a, a, device A will give you the very first address, which is dot one. You know, your host bits will be zero, 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 one. And device B, you'll be the next one, dot two. Great, but remember, I have 254 combinations right here, right? If this entire byte is used for host addresses, but this network only has two devices on it and that's it. So I've got a whole bunch of host addresses that are unused and will never be used because I've only got two devices. So in this case, you could actually give each device a slash 31 subnet mask and a slash 31 sort of uh, breaks the rules a little bit that I was just talking about. A slash 31 says, 
The first eight bits of my address are networking bits. The second eight, the third eight, that's 24 bits so far out of the 32. And then of my last byte, networking bit, networking bit, networking bit, networking bit, networking bit, networking bit. And the only host bit I have is that. And that gives me what? Two combinations, right? That can either be a zero or a one. Now you might be thinking, but wait a second, Keith, you just told us that in IP addressing, the host bits can't be all zeros, they can't be all ones, that breaks the rules. Technically that's right, but on, on some devices like routers, I don't know necessarily a laptop or a PC would allow you to do this, but on some router interfaces, you can actually give it a slash 31, which means the first 31 bits are networking bits that I've just given you, and the router is smart enough to know, okay, this must be a point-to-point -point link where there's only two devices on the link. So my host address will be zero, and the next host address, the only other one, will be one. And so there is no networking address, there is no broadcast address. That's where a slash 31 would be used in something like that. All right, thank you, Masa, for asking that question. Well, let's see here, I see a few more questions. Let me just skip ahead to some of the, the easier ones before I do the complex ones. All right, here's a, a question that Gerardo asks. Do you think that IPv4 will disappear one day in order to just use IPv6? Yes, but probably not in our lifetime. Uh, let's put it that way. I, I think it's going to be, there are so many embedded devices with IPv4 addresses, um, billions and billions of them all throughout the world that are going to be in use for a long, long time. So I would say that IPv4 is not going to vanish for at least a good 30 or 40 years, just off the top of my head. Um, so it's going to be around for a long, long time, even as IPv6 gets more and more used. But you're not the first person who has wondered that question, who has asked it. Okay. And Augustine asks the question, uh, under what circumstances do we use subnet masks and what circumstances do we use wildcard masks? That really depends on uh, what feature you're using in networking. So when you are applying an IP address to an interface, whether it be uh, the network interface on your laptop, your server, your smartphone, a router's interface, when you're applying an IP address to an interface to be used as an identifier for a network, this is who you are on this network. You always use subnet masks. Subnet masks are always paired with that. Now, if you, are, if you have some feature running and you want to type an IP address into that feature and then say, okay, of this 32-bit pattern, which is this IPv, IPv4 address, uh, these are the bits I want you to pay attention to. I don't care about the rest. Pay attention to these. Well, then sometimes features will use subnet masks to do that. Sometimes features will use wildcard masks to do that. It all depends on the feature and the vendor's equipment. I've, I've seen, for example, security features. Secu so I've seen some security features that on Cisco devices, um, you type in an IP address and then use a wildcard mask to say, these are the bits I'm interested in. And then that exact same feature on like a Juniper device or something else will use a subnet mask to identify the bits. So it's, it's really just up to the manufacturer and who wrote the code for that particular feature. But I will tell you that when an IP address is used as an identifier for a device on a network, you know, this is who you are on the network, a subnet mask is always paired up with that. All right, let's see here. Got some good questions coming in. Thanks, guys. All right, there's a lot of stuff. I'm just scanning through the, the easier ones to begin with. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Okay, uh, so Mohammed asked a good question. Uh, will the packet tracer program or application from Cisco be enough for CCNP Enterprise Encore exam in order to practice for it, or do I need GNS3? Packet tracer will not be enough. Absolutely, packet tracer will not be enough to practice your Encore exam. Uh, so you'll need GNS3 or viral, or I guess now viral two is called Cisco Modeling Labs. They came up with a new name. Uh, something that's running real software, real Cisco IOS software for the Encore exam. There's, there's, like I said, the Encore exam has a ton of features and a ton of protocols that you need to know at a very deep level, and Packet Tracer does not support that. So thank you for that question. All right, Charles asks, is it possible to subnet an IPv4 address in under 10 seconds in an exam scenario? Woo, boy, that's a tough one, under 10 seconds. Okay, um, is it possible? Absolutely, uh, it just depends on the complexity of the mask and how many times you've practiced it, for example. Okay, so close your eyes for a second. <laughs> I'm gonna write an IP address and subnet mask, and I'm going to open your eyes and see if you can subnet this in under 10 seconds. This one's gonna be easy, so you should be able to. Uh, let's see here, is it possible to subnet an address? Now, is it possible to subnet an address? So there's a ver variety of ways I could interpret that. Um, I could interpret that as, if I give you an existing host address and a mask, can you tell me what subnet it belongs to? That's part of subnetting, is identifying that. Um, another way I could phrase the question is, if I give you a subnet mask, if I give you a starting mask that your ISP gave you, and then I give you a new subnet mask, can you identify how many networks you were able to create out of that? That's another question. Um, I'm guessing you're at, I'm guessing the, I'm gonna guess that the standpoint you're taking is something like this. Uh, let's just go ahead and write this. You are given the address of 20.1.1. 1.0 slash 24 from your ISP. You need to subnet this such that you end up with six subnets. What will be your new subnet mask in dotted decimal? All right, so this is probably the type of question I'm guessing you're asking. How could you do something like that in 10 seconds or less? All right, so here's how I would do it. Um, I would use the old finger method, okay? So I know what I'm gonna need, I'm gonna explain it longer than 10 seconds. So I know that basically what this is telling me is that I have some address that was given to me that was network, network, network. So that's, that's 24 bits. And then the last eight bits are host bits. So this is my original starting slash 24. So here's the 24 bits that are networking bits. Last eight bits are host bits. Now I know what I need to do is I need to convert some of these host bits into networking bits to give me some variations. Now I know if I, if I converted just one of them into a networking bit, that gives me two combinations, right? So now I could have 20.11 and then I could have this bit is a zero, that's one network, and then 20.11, this bit is a one, that's another network. So that would be slash 25, right? I've just stolen one networking bit. I know if I steal two networking bits, now that gives me four combinations. All of them beginning with 20.1.1, but then combination number one could start out with zero, zero, combination number two could be zero, one, combination three, one, zero, and combination four, one, one. Okay, so how do you, so the, the question is, how many networking bits do I need to steal to give me this 
And how do I figure that out in 10 seconds or less? And this is where I go back to what I say, the finger, the finger method, okay? So with one finger, you just count in multiples of twos. If I steal one bit, they'll give me two subnets, four subnets. Um, and then I just keep uh, doubling eight subnets, 16 subnets, 32 subnets. So if I use that method, now if I rephrase the question like this, okay, your existing subnet mask is 255, 255, 0.0, .0 and you need to create um, 27 subnets. What will be your new subnet mask? All right, here's how I would do that using this, the finger method. Main thing I'm focused on here is this number, 27. All right, two, four, eight, 16, not enough, 32. Now I've got five fingers showing, I need to steal five bits. So if my original subnet mask was 255.255.0.0, which translates to a slash 16, and I need to add five bits to that because five get, bits gave me 32 combinations. 16 plus five, my new subnet mask is gonna be a slash 21. All right, so if that's what you're going for, that's how you do it. Focus in on how many subnets do I need and just start counting out in powers of two with your fingers. Two, four, eight, 16, and just keep going up until you say right there, that will give me at least what I'm looking for. That's, that's the minimum number of fingers I need to hold up to get me that quantity of network. So I'm holding up eight fingers. Okay, take my original subnet, add eight to it. That gives me my new subnet mask. So hopefully that helped. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? I'll take uh, another three questions and then we should, then at that point it'll be about a couple hours since we started, then we'll stop. Okay. Uh, Devendra, I'll just ask, answer that real quickly here. Devendra asks, can you briefly talk about the CCIE lab Encore? Well, there is no Encore lab. So there you go. The, the CCMP, Encore exam is just a written exam. Now they call it a written exam, but it's a computer-based exam. You sit down in front of a computer and you know at some testing center and the vast majority of questions you get will be multiple choice questions with some other question types as well. But uh, there is no CCNA or CCNP lab exam. They're all computer-based. Now when you get to the CCIE enterprise, there is a CCIE enterprise lab uh, so after you've passed your Encore written exam, now you can go take the lab exam if you want. Um, and I think Brian McGann has got several videos uh, talking about the new lab exam uh, for the CCMP Encore. So I'd, I'd recommend you go on our website and you look for that where he talks about the new structure and what that's like. Uh, so I'll let him do that in his video. All right. A couple more questions here. Um, I don't know if this particular, I know this session is being recorded. I don't know if it'll be uploaded in YouTube. Um, so maybe when, when Brittany brings us to a close here in a couple of minutes, she can speak to that. Um, but I don't know if it will be on YouTube or not. So Brittany, if you're still there, if you can sort of cash that question in your head, I'll let you answer that when you bring us to a close here in just a minute. Uh, do, I do I recommend any particular subnet calculators? No, um, I, I don't use subnet calculators. You know, I. I can do subnetting, you know, in 30 seconds or less. I've just done it thousands of times. Um, but the ones I have seen, they all seem pretty much the same. So there's not any one I would recommend. Uh, Lucas asked a good question. Is there any networking technologies that prefer IPv6 over IPv4 when implementing that technology? 
so that if we want to use that technology, we can find a technical reason to migrate to IPv6. Oh, that's a great question. Um, any technologies that prefer IPv6 over IPv4? Nothing that immediately comes to my mind. I am sure there are some technology that have been developed in the most recent years that were just written for IPv6 only. I can't think of them off the top of my head, um, but I'm sure they exist. And let's see here, what else do we have? Okay, uh, so this will be the last one I, I answer here today. Uh, so Asim says, my internet service provider gave me a slash 31 for a point to point link. And we just talked about slash 31s and another slash 29 as, an, as extra IPs. How do I use the extra IPs? Okay, well, so not entirely, entirely sure why they did that, but here's what you could do. So here's your ISP router, okay? And here's your router. And they gave you a slash 31, which is meant to be used between the two of you. So maybe they said, okay, here, why don't you do this? 100.1.1. Um, and they said, you should be, I'll just say dot X slash 31. They said, you take the dot one address, we'll take the dot zero address. Okay, so because with a slash 31, you've only got two addresses, dot zero and dot one. Now, if that was all they gave you, that would be fine if the only device that ever created traffic was your router. But that's, you've got stuff behind the router, right? You've got laptops and, and printers and, and you know, IP phones and stuff over here. Got maybe a laptop here, maybe a server here. And these devices are gonna be creating packets that need to go out to the internet. Okay, well, there's, there's two ways to do this. Um, as the internet service provider, I probably would have said, this is all you're gonna get, and I want your router to do network address translation uh, so that you, you know, just give your laptop and server some private addresses like 10 dot something or 192 dot something, and when they go through your router, just translate all the source addresses to what's on your router itself but they gave you a slash 29. So maybe they gave you this as well. 100.1.1.8 slash 29. Okay, well with a slash 29 subnet mask, that means that your host addresses, that means you've got six host addresses available to you. So your first address will be .9 all the way to dot, uh, let's see if I can get this right, eight, 16, 15, 14. I think if I've got that right here. Yeah, because with a slash 29, it's in multiples of eights. So eight, 16 is gonna be the next one, 15 will be the broadcast. Uh, so these will be, your host addresses are available. So with your slash 29, I think what they're expecting is that you can have up to six devices here in this, in your network, there you go, and each one of those devices can pull an address from the slash 29 network that they gave you. That way your router won't have to do network address translation. You'll have six publicly routable IP addresses that don't have to be translated from the slash 29. So that's actually pretty nice that they gave that to you. So that's what they're expecting you to do with that slash 29, is to assign it to devices over here on the other side of the router. Now, one of those addresses actually will have to go on the router's interface. So really, you've only got five addresses you can use, not six, because one of them goes on the router itself. All right, folks, uh, that has been 
It's been almost an hour at this point. Thank you all so much for watching this uh, webinar on IPv4 demystification and subnetting demystification. I, I hope you all found it very enjoyable and very enlightening. Also, just so you know, on our INE platform, we have a ton of videos that go into gory detail on this kind of stuff. I have like a three hour course just on IPv4 addressing and subnetting uh, if you want all the, the details behind this. So this was just to whet your appetite for that. So uh, Brittany, are you still with us? Do you wanna close us out here? Yes, I am. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I wrote this in the chat really quick, but um, yes, this will be on YouTube. Um, it probably won't make it to YouTube until uh, late this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning, depending on um, when we get a chance to edit it and get it back from Zoom. Um, but yes, that will be on our YouTube page as well as on our Facebook page um, and on that networking page. Um, there is, or the networking week page, there is a link that you can um, get to. Um, that button will change to a watch now button. I think right now it says register now. Um, and that will change and take you to it as well. Um, and then a couple of people have asked us about um, a couple promotional discounts or um, for our subscriptions during this networking week. I will let you guys know um, there isn't a promotion this week for um, our networking week, um, for our networking pass, but keep an eye out. We're actually launching our Summer of Success promotion um, coming up, I believe, in about a week or so. You should be starting to see some promotion, um, promotional posts about it soon. Um, but keep an eye out for that. That is actually going to be our next kind of big promotion. Um, and we'll be sending out some information via email um, as well as on our social media channels. So be sure you're um, following us on i &E on all of our social channels as well. And then there'll also be a promotional bar, kind of like this networking week, but talking about some of the events we're going to be having for um, Summer of Success. So um, keep that in mind too. I just wanted to let you guys know that as well. All right, everybody. So I guess that will bring us to a close. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, um, some more sessions coming up, I think tomorrow, uh, and certainly other ones scheduled for the future. So thanks everybody and have a great rest of your week.